Uh, Jacob, you allude to the way Australia is perceived on the international stage. There's, there's, I actually participated in a television program in America, two hours, whatever has happened to the Australians, that they allowed themselves to be so tied down and lent on, particularly in the state of Victoria, Melbourne. Uh, it is a wide held, uh, widely held perception. I, I would hope on the other side, which is to raise a new topic, uh, that we might be seen as having been quite plucky and to have stood for our own interests when it comes to the way that the Chinese Communist Party has been behaving. Well, I'm very pleased to come on to that. Um, uh, happy to answer. Uh, uh, I, was, I was astonished by Australia of all countries um, with lots of space being as um, locked down as it was uh, and then finding it very difficult to get out of lockdown uh, and the Australian people putting up with it. It, it, it. But then nobody expected. I, I sat in on meetings at the beginning of lockdown where the experts said to us, well, you will have lockdown fatigue and we must bring in lockdown late because if we bring it in too early, you'll have lockdown fatigue and people won't be taking any notice of it when you really, really need it. That turned out not to be true, that people were happy to be locked down for months and months. Um, but on China, I cannot tell you how much I admire the courage of Australia to its own economic risk of standing up to a totalitarian regime and leading the Western world. That, that the Western world, the US and the UK, were going along with this um, golden age view of China that we could deal with them, ignoring every human rights abuse that was going on in China, the treatment of the Uyghurs, and then the treatment of Hong Kong, and just thinking this could all go along swimmingly. And it was Australia that stood up and said, no, this is not right. Um, we are going to do something about it. You had trade sanctions then slapped on you. You didn't back down. I think you then sold your iron ore to other countries for just as good prices. So the economic effect was not as bad as expected. And then the US and the UK changed. And I, I think this is really important, actually, in terms of, um, there's an awful word, geopolitics, but I can't think of a better one, because it shows what an important, free, mid-sized country can do to change the view of the Western world for the better and for the stronger to stand up for our shared values. I would give quite a bit of credit to Japan as well. And they got some baggage in this area, to be honest, from the 1930s and 40s. But nonetheless, uh, they have made it very plain that uh, they will do their bit. And I think that is an emboldening between the two countries. It's emboldening the region to say, well, we don't have to sacrifice our freedoms and our opportunities to a very authoritarian regime. Always important to distinguish between the Chinese people and the regime. Uh, yeah. Yes, I mean, it is a totalitarian uh, communist regime, uh, and that is not the fault of the Chinese people. They never get a chance to vote for it. But you're right about Japan, and you're right about how Japan has been trying to handle this as tactfully as possible with the difficult history. It's very important. There was an agreement between Japan and South Korea very recently. Yes. And that is... Uh, I, mean, I, I used to be an, an emerging markets investor um, and also included Asia. So I used to go to South Korea quite often. And the um, view of Japan because of the war and because of colonialism is not enormously positive. So that Japan and South Korea are cooperating is, I think, a really important step forward. <laughs>